just a little bit more on this, you know, what is a public health approach? It's really focused on improving the health of a population rather than a focus on individuals. It recognizes that health really is this complicated um, ecosystem that results not only from our genetics and our biology, but also from social determinants of health. Uh, there's a, a nice quote that I like to share sometimes, that public health promotes and protects the health of people and the communities where they live, learn, work, and play. Uh, so we can think about all of those different contexts, communities, and environments that we operate within. A public health approach is also collaborative and interdisciplinary in nature. And so, you know, thinking about how can we promote health among people, how can we um, work with, you know, people in charge of health policies that may have a, a, an impact on, on individual health and population level health. Um, we can think about working with the biostatisticians and the epidemiologists who are tracking uh, the different uh, problems that a population may be experiencing. So really working with different fields and different um, people of different backgrounds is really an important part of a public health approach that everybody has a role to play. Another important part of a public health approach is recognizing that there is no single magic solution, that we always have to tailor any strategies um, to the priority population and to the unique um, problems and opportunities that exist within that particular population. A public health approach is also uh, thinking about um, in this comprehensive way that we want sustainable strategies that really take into, impact, take into consideration the environmental approaches that can be utilized, as well as thinking at the policy level. Uh, and lastly, um, a public health approach uses an evidence-based uh, approach when possible, so really drawing from the data um, and what the research tells us, and when there's a limited um, evidence-based for a particular topic area, then it is theory-informed. And my background is really in uh, social behavior and community health. And so a social behavior approach to these public health um, concerns really takes into account the psychosocial, behavioral, community, and societal influences on the health of a specific population. And it recognizes that, um, you know, it's not just knowledge <laughs> that can change behavior, but that actually there's a, many different influences um, that can change our attitudes and our behaviors, but that simply knowledge is not enough to change behavior. And we want to create interventions that are, uh, the goal of these interventions is to eliminate any specific barriers to health across the lifespan, um, to promote health and really to prevent harm from occurring. And in order to do that, we want to look and see if we can identify any bright spots or any protective factors that exist that promote health and well-being and protect against harm. And on the converse of that, identify any risk factors that result in these adverse health outcomes and work to minimize those risk factors as well. And as I've been saying, public health is really addressing a population, but it's population specific. And so for this, you know, the, the work that I do at a college um, or a university level, the population that I'm always working toward addressing and, and promoting the health and well-being of are college students. And as a result, there are some really important things to consider that are specific to the college student population. So thinking about the developmental hallmarks of this particular age period, of course, recognizing that there are non-traditional uh, students who attend these institutions as well, but um, by and large, the majority of college students are in the adolescent or emerging adulthood phase, and that has some real unique um, uh, markers that we need to think about. This period is filled with transitions. Identity development is quite salient as especially throughout the adolescent period, people are transitioning their primary attachment from their family, their parents, to their peers. Um, it's filled with risk-taking and this kind of feeling of invincibility, um, the growing independence, and at the same time, because the attachment is so strong to other peers, there's a real susceptibility to peer pressure. And of course, throughout this period, with all of these different um, markers, it's typically a period that can be considered filled with, with high levels of stress. So these are important things to consider as you think about developing interventions and working with this population. 
Another thing that is really important is to really engage with stakeholders. As I said, everyone really does have a role to play. Um, so thinking about who are your campus and your community partners. Obviously students, um, administrators and staff that work on the campus, faculty often uh, can be a really important um, uh, stakeholder that are often neglected at times from these different topics. Um, alumni play a really critical role, as well as different community agencies. And um, because of the work that I do, I use a public health approach across multiple interconnected college health issues. And just to share that this public health approach can be used across these different topics, and that is what we do at Cornell. And I'm not sure how many of you are already familiar with the socio-ecological model, um, but this is a really critical uh, component of a public health approach that recognizes that individuals, we don't exist in a vacuum. We operate and, and interact with lots of different spheres of influence. So of course, this multi-level interactive approach to examining the multiple influences on a health-related behavior is really salient to a public health approach. So thinking about at the individual level, you know, we want to work to increase individuals' knowledge and familiarity about, for example, hazing, the phenomena of hazing, the resources that are available to help people prevent hazing or interrupt hazing, and work to change attitudes so that individuals, uh, you know, don't believe that some hazing is acceptable, as an example. At the interpersonal level, we're talking about those interpersonal relationships uh, that people have with family, with friends, their social networks, our friend groups, and this can include social media as well. And we often know that students disclose um, salient information to their friends first because of their developmental stage that they're going to turn to their peers. And so we want to make sure that peers know how to respond in a supportive and helpful way uh, when this information is shared with them. At the organizational level, um, you know, we belong to all sorts of different organizations. And so it's important, especially on a college campus, thinking about student organizations that students belong to, they may be athletic, you know, they may be an athletic team, they may be part of a social sorority or a fraternity or a performing arts club, um, and the ways in which organizations um, play an important role in, in hazing in particular, of course, is quite important. We'll talk more about that later. At the community level, we're talking about the different communities uh, that people belong to, either based on their identities, their religion, their culture. Um, their geographic community, where they're coming from, and what the norms are from where, they, uh, where they've where they come from and what the norms are of the uh, community in which they currently exist within. Um, and that can also include the institutional level. What are the institution uh, institutional norms at the college campus? And then lastly, at that um, final level, the public policy level, this can sometimes also be considered the society level or kind of the local, state, and national laws and policies um, that exist and have an influence over communities. So I mentioned that I work at Cornell University, and just to share a little bit about the context of our institution, uh, Cornell University is located in uh, Ithaca, New York, which is a small city in um, a rural part of, of New York State, um, while the medical school, Weill, and our New York City Tech campus are located in New York City. Um, the main campus is located in upstate New York. We're a private university with a New York State land grant status, and we have a, about 15,000 undergraduate students and a, about 8,500 graduate professional students. Among our undergraduate student body, individuals um, belong to lots of different student organizations. And as you can see on the slide, there's literally over a thousand student organizations that are registered with the university that people can belong to. Uh, there are a number of social sororities and fraternities that individuals can join starting their second semester on campus. Um, and about a third of our undergraduate student body uh, typically chooses to do so and about 10% of our undergraduate students are varsity student athletes. With that, a little bit of background. Cornell University does, in fact, recognize hazing as a really serious public health issue um, in that hazing encompasses a range of practices that can uh, be damaging to the physical and psychological well-being of individuals who are joining or continuing membership in a variety of groups, teams, and organizations. And we know that the impact of hazing on individuals can be severe, long-lasting, and, and even fatal at times. And so as such, Cornell, we use this comprehensive socio-ecological approach that really addresses individuals, groups, the institution, the local community, national organizations where appropriate, 
and the broader society.